Close. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> now, Professor Jeff Ashton uh, graduated from our philosophy department here at LMU and was sparked by Antonio de Nicholas's translation and interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita to the extent that he went off to the University of Chicago to do a master's degree in Sanskrit and then discovered the lack of a good committee at the August Institution, sorry to that, and traveled as a philosopher to the University of Hawaii, but there was a big asterisk. We will let you study here, but you have to learn Thai. So he funded his doctorate by learning Thai, teaching Sanskrit, studying with no other than the August Arindam Chakrabarti. You're safe. <laughs> and he did this remarkable work building on this interest that is at the core of Sri Vidya. You know, what is myself and what is my circumstance? What is this relationship between, I, I hate these words, I'll use Prussian property, but spirit and matter, I mean, this, these are the enduring questions. And what we can see from his title is he likes words, and you're going to hear a lot of them. And I'm sure they will be beautifully illustrated here. So I'm so happy to welcome Jeff back, prodigal son, went out, did well. He moved from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, through his own will, through his own volition, to uh, the University of San Francisco, returning to the Jesuit institutional fold, and we're just really proud of Jeff. So, welcome Jeff Ashton. Namaskar, Salatika, time speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that it's really great introduction. Uh, it, it's a real pleasure, real honor to speak here at my alma mater. I think this is, I think this is my first talk here, actually, since, uh, <coughs> since leaving here, graduating here in 1999. And I'm also, to be, uh, I'm also honored to be part of this celebration of, of the Shastri's book, uh, <coughs> and to share my thoughts on, on the book and themes touched upon in the book. Uh, <coughs> works such as this book I, I find to be especially important Again, my, my, my training is in philosophy, so my training is maybe not as culturally nuanced as uh, many of the other scholars in the room. And so my reflections here will, will reflect that. But what I found in reading through the book um, <clears throat> that we're here celebrating today is that uh, it really adds so much to the integrity and the vitality of scholarship on Indian philosophy and religions because it points to important themes that oftentimes uh, get overlooked or underappreciated as certain ways of reading texts get emphasized and others less so. And this, I think, is especially true of Shankara. Um, Shankara, right, are the paradigmatic Advaitin thinker, one of India's great philosophical heroes. And the way in which he is read oftentimes, uh, I think, reflects the way in which Indian philosophy and Indian religion are, are largely read. The standard reading of Shankara gives us a person who is concerned with world renunciation, identification with a gender neutral, non-relational Brahman, overcoming the emotions, the heart, uh, and dissociation from the body. And this is the, kind of the standard reading. Uh, certainly it's, what empha it's what's emphasized uh, in the study of uh, Indian philosophy. Uh, but the Shastri's compelling arguments in the book here presents a Shankara as the author of the Sri Lalita Trishati Bhashyam. It gives us a very different, shows us a very different side of Shankara. Uh, <coughs> shows us a very different side of Shankara. It reveals a Shankara who is positively concerned with the field of engaged action, devotion as a means to liberating self-knowledge, the power of mantric performance or recitation, and the importance of the feminine. This points to features that are equally hallmarks in Indian philosophy and religion, contrary to exoticizations of Indian philosophy as being merely concerned with the transcendence of duality and cold, dispassionate Gnostic realization. The Shastri's point to this, uh, to these perhaps less appreciated features of Shankara throughout the book. And I've just pulled out a, a few things to highlight here. 
Uh, first concerns the goddess. She is the inconceivable, immeasurable power, the being of all which exists. Maya is the power of Shakti. Creation is a mode of divine existence and divine energy which sustains the universe. Concerning re relationality, the Shastris highlight the dynamic between Shiva and Shakti uh, and one's re-identification with not just the god and not just the goddess, but the interplay between the two. Professor Shastri writes, Worshippers of Sri Vidya have to see the whole universe as the culmination of the static and dynamic poses of Shiva and Shakti, as the consummation of their, of their consciousness bliss. And among other things, they also speak and give attention to devotion by way of play. Quote, Lolita means she who plays. All creation, manifestation, and dissolution are considered to be a play of Devi, or the goddess. Far from denying or negating life, here we find a great affirmation of life that proceeds by way of playful relationship with the mother goddess. Indeed, there's positive valuation of transcendence, non-duality, and mystical self-realization. But the text, the text presents this through a much more Shaiva or Shakta lens than the kind of the standard reading of Advaita Vedanta. <clears throat> much of my own work on Indian aesthetics echoes some of these uh, paradigm shifts. Uh -oh. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, much of my own work on Indian aesthetics echoes some of these paradigm shifts. And the paper that I share here is specifically concerned with how the myth of Shiva Shakti has influenced the arts of India, as well as philosophical thinking about the arts. Through the course of the paper, I hope to examine, or will examine how the goddess, relationality, devotion, and liberating play are central to Indian art culture. I hope to successfully challenge still prevailing views, both in the West and in India, that Indian arts, uh, as as we also misunderstand Indian philosophy and Indian religion, is essentially transcendental and world negating. This will begin with consideration of the prominence of mimesis theory. And mimesis, at least in the West, is typically rendered as imitation or representation. And it's often, uh, often implies representation of an external world that exists independently of the knower. This is important to keep in mind. So I'll begin with uh, examination of the prominence of mimesis theory in Indian art practice and commentarial literature. Uh, and then after this, I will examine Abhinavagupta's own aesthetic theory, and uh, <clears throat> Lorelai nicely uh, kind of alluded to some of these uh, brilliant features of Abhinava's aesthetic theory, as found in his Abhinava Bharati, wherein Abhinava rejects Mimesa's theory in order to accommodate his view that the art experience entails indeed a particular kind of transcendence. But the question is, does his aesthetic theory make Indian art into something otherworldly, hostile to mimesis, imitation, or representation, and, quote-unquote, transcendental, or at least transcendental as it's commonly understood in kind of exoticizations, again, of Indian philosophy, religion, and here, the arts? So I'll return to this question at the end of the paper. Now, for those who are not so familiar with Indian art terminology, Realism and naturalism, as general terms for art, strive to accurately represent the visible world. They aim to portray things just as they are, independent of our interpretation of them. Realism and naturalism also, also label specific period styles in the arts, especially painting. Uh, and we're talking here about the mid to late 1800s in Europe and North America. They give special attention to real, contemporary, ordinary people and situations. This historical detail is significant for the construction of Indian culture, at least the Western construction of Indian culture. The realist and naturalist movements rejected the exotic subject matter, exaggerated sentimentality, and, and idealized depictions that predominated in Romanticism. And interestingly, it was largely a Romanticist attitude that was responsible for making Indian culture known to the West, making it known, again, by exoticizing it and hastily determining that mimesis, among other things, mimesis never existed in Indian art. <coughs> art historical discourse has been reluctant to acknowledge the place of mimesis in Indian art and aesthetics, 
largely due to the cultural, uh, the colonial conditions under which the discipline of art history emerged and developed in India. In the midst of the late 1700s push to categorize Indian artifacts, and this is a time when British colonialism is increasing its grip upon India, but it's also a time when Romanticism is beginning to take hold in Europe, Mimesis was deemed to have no place outside the West. This trend in thinking about Indian art continued well into the 20th century, as evidenced by the writings of art critics such as John Ruskin. <clears throat> Ruskin comments, Indian art never represents a natural fact. If it represents any living creature, it represents that creature under some distorted and monstrous form. To all the facts and forms of nature, it willfully and resolutely opposes itself. It will not draw a man, but an eight-armed monster. Perhaps this monster here, also known as the god of good beginnings uh, and uh, removing fear of all things. <clears throat> this anti-representation bias with respect to Indian arts parallels an anti-realism bias with respect to Indian philosophy. That is a bias that Indian philosophers were uh, wholly denied any value to an independent existing world in itself. And such an attitude was equally strong at home, albeit in a very different form. 20th century uh, Indian art, historian, art historians, excuse me, such as A.K. Kumaraswamy, uh, pictured here, pushed back against Western imperialists by claiming that Indian art resided on a higher plane, a higher plane than the naturalistic, degenerate art of the West. <laughs> but while Indian transcendentalists, such as Kumaraswamy, rescued a sense of agency for Indian artists and aestheticians, they inadvertently strengthened Western ethnocentrism by creating a binary between the materialist West, which had exclusive right to realism, naturalism, and mimesis, and the spiritual East. And this, uh, this trend actually still continues, uh, still runs strong today. More careful, less politically motivated scholarship convincingly, convincingly demonstrates that just as mimesis and related terminology have played a formative role in the history of Western art and aesthetics, so too have Anukriti and associated concepts occupied a prominent place in Indian art and commentarial literature. Mimesis and Anukriti, of course, bear different histories of usage, but the linguistic, artistic, and intellectual overlaps are significant enough as to uh, warrant this comparison. Etymologically, the term Anukriti, Anu plus Kriti, derived from the verb Krut, means acting after, making after, or following the making of. Art practices from at least as early as the second century CE were especially informed by a mimetic attitude, so much so that its influence were, was taken for granted, especially in painting and theater. As for Indian aesthetic theory, it boasts a rich, sophisticated, and historically deep discourse on the nature of Anukriti. <clears throat> the mo uh, this is most evident in the Abhinava Bharati, Abhinava Gupta's 11th century commentary on the Nakya Shastra, India's poor text on dramaturgy. Ironically, however, the Abhinava Bharati, which is often thought to display the greatest refinement and innovation in thinking about mimesis in India, this same text is the very text which is most responsible for the demise of Anukriti Vada in Indian arts and, intellectual, and Indian intellectual history. Abhinava sought to discredit mimesis theory by staging a debate with Shankuka, India's most sophisticated proponent of Anukriti, and then highlighting the superiority of his own view over that of Shankuka. In demonstrating this, let's begin by examining briefly Shankuka's theory of Anukriti. Primarily concerned with the aesthetics of theater, Shankuka locates Anukriti at the intersection of mimesis and mimicry. He highlights the actor's virtuosity in performing a depersonalized body language, the expressive movements of which display emotions pertaining only to the dramatic character. This is very important. The emotions pertain to the dramatic character, not to the actor himself. Uh, I'm not sure uh, whether or not the South Indian tradition of Katakali, this is pictured here, uh, an actor in training. I'm not sure if this is influenced directly by Shankuka's thinking, uh, but nonetheless, Katakali actor training exercises utilize the artifice of dramatic conventions in order to mimetically bring to life the real emotions of the character. In this case, the fear of the demon prince 
Ravana. <clears throat> the actor's outward movements temporarily bring to presence the emotion of an otherwise absent person. Again, Ravana. Shankuka explains how this brings with it certain requirements for the cognitive attitude of the audience. The spectators to hold neither the true nor the false belief that the performer is the fearful Ravana. In fact, the audience member should neither doubt whether the actor is Ravana, nor take the actor's appearance to be a mirage that gets corrected after the play through exposure to the actor's true identity. More positively speaking, the audience member identifies the actor's movements as inferential signs pointing to the character's motion. Now, Abhinava is going to reject Shankuka's theory, and he does this in a very step-by-step -step manner. He begins by clarifying the two criteria for genuine mimesis. The first, consciousness of the object to be imitated. And the second, consciousness of the thing which imitates. In the visual arts, Anukriti obtains where one has perceptual access to a model. For example, an actual horse. And the artwork's resemblance to that model can be checked. But in the case of drama, Abhinava argues, the actor does not have access to the original, for example, Ravana, against which to test his mimicry. And hence, the, uh, the actor cannot provide an imitation of Ravana's angry behavior, for the actor has never encountered Ravana, who either has long been deceased or never even existed in the first place. Thus, the dramatic character or the emotion as the object of mimesis lies beyond the scope of imitation. Lacking referentiality to support his imitation, the actor simply has nothing to mimic. Abhinava's critique of inference as the mechanism by which the audience experiences our emotion follows from this. Inference cannot occur because, simply put, the object of inference does not exist, as we just said. How can one be said to infer Ravana's fear if Ravana himself as the object of inferential knowing, does not even exist. Instead of leading one to actually existing art emotions, the actor's physical movements, which themselves are feigned or fake, these movements lead the audience to infer false emotion. This makes no sense, Abhinava says. Abhinava, of course, emerges as the victor in this debate and also in the intellectual history of South Asia. We know very little about Shankuka outside of Abhinava's own writings. But Shankuka actually offers a much more sophisticated theory than Abhinava gives him credit for. <clears throat> As just demonstrated, Shankuka argues that art appearances are qualitatively distinct from appearances in ordinary life. They are neither real, false, nor somewhere in between the two. Doubts and knowledge claims concerning the truth or falsity of an event make no sense in the art worlds of visual representation and dramatic performance since art identifications require illusion, maya, as it were. Hence, Shankuka actually agrees with Abhinava. What is at stake in the experience of visual or performance art is neither a rela relationship of similarity or difference between the imitated object and imitating agent, for there is no original object to be imitated. Rather than assuming that there is some e uh, external, already existing world to which art appearances refer, and this is the assumption that Abhinav is trying to pin on Shankuka. Shankuka decenters the question of resemblance apart from mimesis. <clears throat> In lieu of a representation mimesis that centers around the phenomenon of copying, again, copying an external, independently existing object, Dave Mukherjee, art historian uh, who is at JNU, she contends that what we have here is a performative mimesis. She writes, Mimetic action is a perpetual illusion, a constant displacement through the production of doubles. Mimetic practice is that which establishes, through performative enactment, relationships between that which represents and that which is represented. The epistemological status of an image need not coincide with its truth claim, that is, its truth claim to something external to it. For Shankuka, Anukriti is so expansive a concept, uh, a concept that it can accommodate a wide variety of relationships. For example, a toilet performing the role of a fountain, or a biologically male actor performing the role of a biologically male character, 
who undergoes a gender reassignment surgery. These relationships dispense with allegiance to strict correspondence truth claims. Shakuka highlights this in his analysis of art illusion. Art appearances are self-consciously presented as artificial or merely seeming to be real, and hence they require an entirely unique form of judgment, a form of judgment that art connoisseurs actually embrace. We want to be deceived when we go to the theater or when we go to the movies. Shankuka accommodates this by articulating an epistemology for aesthetic pleasure, or ontology, that is the question of what is this, really? These questions have no place, Shankuka tells us. Thus, Shankuka provides us with a mimetic theory that does not presuppose the metaphysical realism of the art movements of realism and naturalism in the West. More accurately, he, he approximates contemporary post-structuralist theories of representation that reject the binary opposition between original and its copy, or natural and man-made. But Avinava overlooks Shankuka's ingenuity, and he very cleverly misattributes to Shankuka a rather undeveloped version of mimesis. Abhinava's oversight is particularly uh, curious. And here's why. Because Abhinava is typically he's a very cautious interpreter. And he's also a very generous interpreter. And so it's not unlike him to kind of create a straw man just for the sake of you know, gaining, uh, winning the argument. So why does Abhinava misread Shankuka's Anukriti theory? We certainly can't say for certain why he does so. Uh, Abhinava definitely doesn't announce why he misreads Shankuka, let alone announce that he acknowledges Shankuka at all. And no doubt, much of Abhinava's critique holds weight. What I will focus on here is Abhinava's effort to reformulate the orthodox Indian concept of maya, or illusion. I believe that Abhinava resists Shankuka's position because the same concepts, concerns, and strategies that are encoded in Abhinava's broadly cohesive intellectual system, these are replicated in his philosophical aesthetics. In particular, his concern to reformulate illusion, art illusion, in terms of the central myth of Shiva Shakti. At the heart of Abhinava's philosophy is a drama of Shiva at play with his consort, Shakti. In this interplay, Shiva exhibits an almost bipolar personality. To the one extreme, he's introverted and at peace, sitting atop a snow-clad mountain, wholly frozen in the blissful realization that all is one. But when Shakti calls him forth into the world, in one myth, by covering, uh, placing her hands over his eyes, Shiva becomes a raging extrovert, creating distinction through sometimes violent activity. This, in turn, incurs the rage of Shakti, and she promptly subdues her lover. Shakti, meanwhile, also plays shifting roles. In the first account, she represents the world that Shiva has absorbed into himself, while in the second, she compels him to not just recognize an external world, but to submit to it. <clears throat> For Shaiva philosophers such as Abhinava, the purpose of this myth is both descriptive and prescriptive. Descriptively speaking, it illustrates how lived reality plays out, with my own I or self performing the role of Shiva and the other playing the part of Shakti. <clears throat> Prescript, uh, excuse me, prescriptively speaking, however, I as Shiva am not condemned to suffer this endless alternation between self-withdrawal and worldly involvement. In realizing my true agency as the mythic Shiva, I come to recognize that the purpose of this drama is to reunite with the other, Shakti, in the form of creative union. Abhinava's philosophical frameworks recapitulate this myth through what can be termed an, an agential narrative ontology. As an ontology, this narrative accounts for the being, becoming, and dissolution of reality. <clears throat> Abhinava's epistemology runs parallel to this ontology. Reality is invariably lived, and the story of lived reality is the story of the existence growth, and reabsorption of Shiva's own consciousness. Nothing, then, exists external to or is ultimately distinct from Shiva's consciousness. What's more, the agency of Shiva is the driving impetus and central theme of this narrative, hence an agential narrative ontology. Corresponding to the mythical depictions of Shiva in relation to Shakti are two phases that mark out the unfolding of Shiva consciousness. 
And, and Lorelai, you've nicely brought attention to this in your last presentation. Uh, Prakasha and Bimarsha. Symbolized by Shiva in deep contemplation, Prakasha represents a period of latency wherein all the seeds of the manifest universe rest within the undivided Shiva. Literally canoning light, Prakasha signifies the self-aware luminosity of Shiva as transcendental, non-dual consciousness that is identical with pure being itself. Vimarsha, meanwhile, represents the emanation of Shiva into a real world of multiplicity through his design, divine consort, Shakti. Over the course of 34 stages of emanation, a dynamic vibration, Spanda, polarizes the Shiva-Shakti unity into consciousness, the Shiva principle, and the object of consciousness, the Shakti principle, with Shakti dressing herself in the seductive illusions of Maya. This is problematic for a couple reasons. First, Shiva forgets his true nature as an aboriginal unity with Shakti, and Shakti stands as other against an isolated empirical eye. The second problem is that Shakti, which of course means power, Shakti represents Shiva's original power or powers that now manifest as if operating of their own accord, even against the will of Shiva. But the agential force behind this story is, of course, the will of Shiva himself. Accordingly, the other side of this narrative foregrounds the agential freedom of Shiva. Upon completing its descent into disintegration and alienation by way of the Vimarsha stage, Consciousness re-inaugurates the Prakasha phase by withdrawing upon itself. One by one, the diversity of phenomena and their underlying principles of manifestation become reabsorbed into pure consciousness and being. Mark Tchaikovsky, we were talking about earlier, he explains, It is common in these Shaiva works for the author to express the notion that an object is manifest, appears, is visible, or just simply exists, by saying that it shines. All things participate in the one reality, and nothing shines, that is nothing appears, manifests, or exists in its apparent form, if it is not illuminated by the light of consciousness, Prakasha. If phenomena were to be anything but light, they could not shine, Abhasa, that is, they could not exist. Abhasa, interestingly, is cognate with the Greek term phenomenon, like Abhasa from pas, and phenomenon from pus. During this Prakasha phase, each and every entity or phenomenon manifests as the shining forth, the abhasa of Shiva himself, not as something actually alien to the subject. Now, the relevance of this. <clears throat> Abhinava appropriates the notion of Prakasha from Advaita Vedanta. And he agrees with Advaita Vedanta about thinking about Maya on a number of fronts. First, the phenomenal world does not exist external to consciousness. Second, the true self is not bound to its empirical identity. Third, one's essential nature is found by taking repose in a cosmic subjectivity or a pure I consciousness. And fourth, philosophy can serve as a spiritual exercise for securing freedom apart from Maya. However, contrary to Advaita Vedanta, Abhinava does not take phenomena to be illusions that get sublated. They are illusions in some sense, but they are not illusions to be sublated. Nor are phenomena born of a metaphysical obscurity that is distinct from the true self. Rather, Abhinava reduces Maya to the fact of awareness itself. Maya belongs to and expresses the absolute freedom of Shiva to manifest as what he is not without ceasing to be himself. Maya is the very power of Shiva consciousness and hence reveals, rather than conceals, the nature of reality as the play of Shiva Shakti. Abhinava explains, The Supreme Lord, who has the nature of awareness, makes his own self into an object of cognition, even though it is not an object of cognition, because the cognizer is unitary. As he recognitively apprehends his self, so, because everything is contained within him, he appears as blue, etc. Shiva has desires all his own, including the urge for an inner blissful vibration that moves the compact mass of eye consciousness towards self-fragmentation in order to facilitate consciousness's own recognition, in, uh, own recognition of itself in the other. This represents the most characteristic feature 
of Shiva's creative intentionality, the growth of recognitive awareness, or pratyabhijñam. And <clears throat> facilitating this growth of uh, recognitive awareness through an ongoing play of self-forgetting in the face of the other and self-rediscovery through the other. Abhinava explains, Abhinava explains how this free, vibrant, reflexive consciousness can take up all tasks. It makes the other oneself, turns oneself into another, unifies both into one, rejects this unified mix of the two. Such is its nature. It is that spontaneous inner dialogue that imbues our consciousness with a self-marveling chamatkara, or a self-wondering, at its own overflowing fullness. This points to the role of philosophical inquiry in expanding recognitive awareness but only by virtue of Abhinavas having recapitulated philosophy as a potential reenactment of the Shiva Shakti myth. This is very important. You must recapitulate philosophy as this particular kind of activity. To this end, he overcodes the theoretical advances of Advaita Vedanta and Shaiva symbolism, namely Maya as illusion, now reformulated as the emanated Shakti, while Prakasha gets reconceived in terms of the growth of recognitive awareness through the reabsorption of maya. So in closing, <clears throat> I will address two lingering issues here. First is the question of why Abhinava dismissed Shankuka's theory of mimesis. The presiding concern of Abhinava's philosophical system, and this includes his aesthetic theory, his presiding concern is the growing recognition of one's agential freedom through awareness of one's identity with Shiva's mythic agency, that is the agency of Shiva at play with Shakti, as disclosed through, uh, through the mythology. This liberating self-awareness must proceed through the other. One comes to the realization of oneself as Shiva consciousness by way of recognition of oneself as Shakti, dressed in Mayak appearances. As a systematic and inclusive thinker, Abhinava endeavors to reenact this mythical drama in a variety of, er variety of areas of discourse and human activity. And this includes the experience of art. Abhinava rejects Shankuka's theory of mimesis, at least in part because Shankuka, not unlike Advaita Vedanta, reduces phenomena to mere illusions that are divorced from reality. According to Shankuka, art gives us a mere play of illusions that suspends, that suspends reality in order, to secure, in order to secure the autonomy of art as a space for a free play of appearances. But this would stifle the reenactment of the ritual drama of Shiva Shakti, which must proceed through recognizing, or that is recognizing, the other as both real and an expression of one's own desire for a play of proliferation and reabsorption. Art illusions, then, must be adapted to the mythical play of Shiva Shakti so that the audience can relish the stage drama through the unique judgment that I am that, a recognition that theater is especially suited to evoke. Second issue, and this is the final point here. <clears throat> this concerns what I mentioned in my introductory comments. Does Abhinava's aesthetic theory make Indian art into something otherworldly, hostile to mimesis, and transcendental? Even within the Western genealogy of mimesis, we observe shifting usages. Through the early Greek view of mimesis, uh, I'm sorry, though the early Greek view of mimesis is often dominated by Plato's diminished understanding of imitation, many of the ancient Greeks located mimesis within the creative process of artwork making, not in the relationship between what gets presented in the artwork and what is external to it, its presumed reference. This is evident in their using mimesis more often than not to refer to stage acting, that is to refer to the creative process of artwork making on the stage, and less so referring to copying or representing. <clears throat> the beloved scholar of Indian philosophy and philosopher of arts, Eliot Deutsch, speaks to this point. Eliot writes, imitation in art, I want to argue, means properly and acting out a drawing from the very root of spiritual being so that the artwork can present or perform with power, uh, with power its own aesthetic content or meaning. 
To imitate an art, I believe, means properly to have the expressive content of the work grounded in reality. That work of art is most truly imitative, which is a concentration of the power of spiritual being. To imitate an art thus means to be determined by reality at its most essential level. It means to have one's creative drive be in accord with, be derived from, a natural spiritual rhythm and power of being. I think Abhinava may be concerned with just this power of spiritual being. <clears throat> this shakti that tends to diminish in mundane life, but which art helps us to rejuvenate. Seen in this light, mimesis in Abhinava's system might get re-emphasized as an identification between oneself as an ego and the Shiva who recovers union with Shakti. According to many contemporary theorists of mimesis, nature deeply influences the artist. Like the devotee, or rather like Shiva in the face of the powerful Shakti, the artist shows a certain obedience to nature, feminized in Sanskrit as Prakriti, Maya, Shakti. The artist shows an obedience to nature in the sense of her or his recognition of belonging to it. But this belonging is not passive, it is rather an active participation in or partaking of vitality and emulating this creative activity through the making of the artwork. Abhinava celebrates the imagination, much like metaphysical idealist thinkers such as Schopenhauer, for whom imaginative construction was a way of disclosing the essential character of reality. For Abhinava, this ability to imagine things as other than they literally are was a way of reenacting or imitating creation itself, which proceeds through the ecstatic union of Shiva Shakti. It provides a way of overcoming one's estrangement from reality by opening one to reality, not withdrawing from it. The activity of creative imagination, or pratibha, is free from the seeing of things in terms of habituated karmic response, and yet is not random. For it employs, I'm sorry, for it enjoys its obedience to reality by participating in its essential creativity. Thank you. Lorelai. Thought of it that way. Um, well, yeah, know. right, right. But that makes that makes perfect sense. <clears throat> and I think that um, his answer, his answer to the to the Buddhist logicians actually can be can be nicely um, used as a model for kind of elaborating the rationale behind his response to this answer by Shankuka. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think you're right with that. Um, and certainly this form of kind of logical, these logical games are familiar to yeah. philosophers by this time. But here's one difference is this, is that, and I haven't spoken to this, is that Abhinava also rejects Shankuka's position because of his epistemology. Shankuka says that inference is the means by which we enjoy the art experience, that we infer the, that the character is experiencing this emotion. And, um, and this is something that the Buddhists won't fall for. <clears throat> what Shankuka falls for is kind of like through the back door. What creeps in is realism. Because if inference is the epistemology, then it must, it must be something that you're inferring. Right? And the Buddhists won't, won't grant that. Maybe Sautantika. Sautantika. Yeah, they used to, you know, they, uh, they would use inference as a way of... of uh-huh. Yeah. Interesting. But, um, but no, but I, uh, yeah, I'm... I'm well, thank, thank you for that. I'm going to give that some more thought. Yeah. Another question? There was, there, there was a lot of um, European prejudice, of course. It wasn't just Ruskin, but, you know, Hegel and, mm -hmm. and, and people like that, or, or even from some of, the, some of the descriptions that Max Muller and people were giving out about Indian 
Indian icons and goddesses and so forth. So it was pretty, pretty rife in that. But then, the, 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 but then there wasn't the same kind of uh, appreciation as of Greek art, where you know there was a lot of emphasis on tragedy and so forth. And I sort of wondered why they never quite saw. You know, of course they had no exposure to something like Kotakale, of course. You know, or perhaps uh, also Kataka. I mean, I, I don't know what art form they were seeing until Kumar, Kumar Swami brings out uh, brings out the, the series and 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 so forth. So. Yeah, I, 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 um, I've, I've always, always wondered where the prejudice came from, you know, such a rife prejudice that prevailed in the West part of Orientalism that Said and people also talk about. Can you say something on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's, I don't think it's unrelated that aesthetics as a discipline, as a discipline within philosophy is born very late in Western philosophy. Um, <clears throat> sure, I mean, it's there in Aristotle with the poetics. So. Right, but he, even Aristotle, um, his poetics doesn't really get much attention in amongst philosophical circles right, true. until much, much later. True. And it's really the case that metaphysics is first philosophy right, right. throughout the, va the long history of Western philosophy until recently. Right. Right. And many philosophers who want to kind of want to change that are, particularly 20th century philosophers, are, are approaching traditional philosophical, philosophical themes like representation by way of aesthetics, by way of philosophical aesthetics. Now, in addition to that, is that there's also a long history of kind of using the visual arts as the paradigm for understanding the art experience. This is a long history in Western, I think, art history, thinking about art generally. Now, this is relevant because it's precisely what Abhinava is trying to, uh, he is, he's trying to accuse Shankuka of being guilty of a kind of a visual art approach. Mm -hmm. You can have representation mimesis in the visual arts. Right. You can easily point to an object the art the painter is representing. But this doesn't hold in theater. Right. But theater, I mean, theater doesn't really get talked about in a very rigorous philosophical way in the West until very late. Now, Aristotle talks about it in his poetics, but he doesn't, he doesn't link it up with these metaphysical issues, these ontological issues of realism, idealism, right. or this kind of um, non-dual kind of idealism. There, certainly there's nothing like this that manifests in Western philosophy until very late. Uh, phenomenology right, really has to come in until we can get something useful for understanding Abhinavagupta's uh, philosophy, as you pointed out in the Q&A in the last session.